How are we? Good. Good. Happy Super Bowl Sunday slash Valentine's Day tomorrow. Big weekend. What's that? Super Bowl Sunday. Yeah, Valentine's Day is tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. If you didn't know, fellas, Valentine's Day is tomorrow. Okay. Hot mic. Hey, I just want to start by thanking, he's going to hate this, but Nate Martin, he keeps that, our, he keeps a lot of snow off of our parking lot. He and his guys. There's, if you haven't noticed, there's been a lot of snow the last few weeks, and he does a great job of just making sure we can park here, which is a big deal, right? So thank you. He hates every second of this, but that's all right. So hey, everybody, as you may know, we are in a series called, uh, or just about our core values, called Values in the Kingdom. We are in our our fourth value called Owning a Supernatural Lifestyle. And uh, let me read you the definition of that. So first slide. We thrive in risk, faith, miracles, signs, and wonders as we partner with the Holy Spirit, being free to live a supernatural life instead of living in the brokenness of sin and religious bondage. As we go through this value, we're going to be talking a lot about the gifts of the Spirit and how the the Spirit wants to use those to form the body of Christ in the kingdom of God here on earth. Uh, There's four different lists that the Spirit gives the church in the New Testament. We're going to kind of be looking at one kind of special category of gifts. They're not better than any other gifts. They're just different. They're called the charismatic gifts. Paul refers to them with this unique word, the charismata. And so they're manifestations of the Spirit. There's a supernatural dimension to these gifts. For that reason, they tend to also be the most controversial, right? And I'll get into why in a bit, but let's start by reading 1 Corinthians 12. And I'll read verse 1 and then verses 4 through 13. So Paul says, Now, dear brothers and sisters, regarding your question about the special abilities the Spirit gives us, I don't want you to misunderstand this. So that's why we're talking about this value. We don't want to misunderstand this. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but is the same God who does the work in all of us. And you see, when Paul talks about the gifts, all the gifts, he's always emphasizing the same Spirit, the same God, because these gifts are supposed to work together. Right? They're not ever in competition with each other but under under the direction of the same God, same Lord, same Spirit. Uh, He goes on to say, A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. To one person, the Spirit gives the ability to give wise advice. To another, the same Spirit gives a message of special knowledge. The same Spirit gives great faith to another. And to someone else, the one Spirit gives the gift of healing. He gives one person the power to perform miracles and another the ability to prophesy. He gives someone else the ability to discern whether a message is from the Spirit of God or another spirit. Still, another person is given the ability to speak in unknown languages, while another is given the ability to interpret what is being said. It is the one and only Spirit who distributes all these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. The human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews, some are Gentiles, some are slaves, and some are free. But we have all been baptized into one body by one spirit, and we all share the same spirit. All right, so it's clear from this passage, as it is from uh, a number of other passages, that the, the Holy Spirit for Paul and the early Christians wasn't simply a concept of, or, or just a concept or a belief that they had. It's really clear the Holy Spirit for them was an experienced reality. The Holy Spirit was someone they had an ongoing relationship with. The Holy Spirit was someone who directed them, led them, empowered them, and the Holy Spirit was someone they listened to and submitted to on a day-by-day, moment-by-moment basis. And you find this throughout the New Testament. If you look at the book of Acts, or what's called the Acts of the Apostles, it really, I think, should be called the Acts of the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit's poured out, then there's immediately this, this manifestation of different supernatural things. And then throughout the book of Acts, you find the Holy Spirit leading people, guiding people, directing people, telling Paul, don't go to that city, go to this other city. And he's directing things. There's an experienced reality there. They had a supernatural dimension to their faith. 
And the Holy Spirit intersected with their life on a regular basis. In fact, Paul goes so far as to say that this is not like just a special case for super spiritual people. He says, as many who are led by the Spirit are children of God. His assumption is that if you're going to be a child of God, you're going to be led by the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit will be present in your life, directing you, empowering you. And our job then is to be following his lead. And so in the New Testament, in the early church, the Holy Spirit wasn't just simply something that they believed in as a concept. It was an experienced reality. They lived in the Spirit. They walked in the Spirit. And the Spirit moved through them and led them and directed them. So now let's ask the tough question. I mean, really, when it comes down to it, for many of us, what happened? When was the last time you did something you didn't plan on doing because you just sensed you were supposed to do it from the Holy Spirit? Was there anything that you did for reasons other than that you wanted to do it? And for a good percentage of us, the answer would probably be no. If we're honest, we tend to be people who do what we want to do. We have our plans, we have our agendas, we do what seems reasonable. We go to the store because we want to go to the store. We bought this thing because it seemed reasonable to buy this thing. We talked to this person because we wanted to talk to this person. And here's the problem with this. If we confess Jesus to be Lord of our life, should we make all the decisions? There seems to be something kind of wrong with that, right? We say he's Lord of our life, but really our life, our real life, our actual life is nothing more than a series of present moments strung together. And we're making the decisions in 99.9% of those moments? In what, if that's happening, what, in what sense is he really Lord of our life? Let's just sit quietly in this uncomfortable observation, would we, Kim? You see, in Acts, that the, that the early church was attentive to hearing the Holy Spirit, listening to the Holy Spirit. This is, I think, why the early church had a supernatural dimension to the walk and, the, and that we kind of tend to lack. They didn't just have their own agendas and their own plans and do their own thing. They, sum, they submitted to him. They had an awareness of his presence and an experiential relationship that caused them to do things they didn't plan. There's a lot of spontaneity stuff that goes on under the direction of the Holy Spirit. So they learn how to walk with the Spirit moment by moment. We tend to govern ourselves moment by moment, to be honest. We tend to re rely on our own power 99.9% of the time. So for us, most of the time, he's just a concept or a mere belief. And I don't say this to shame us or indict us or anything like that. I don't think it's because we're terrible, evil people who are running from God. But I do think that there's just a lot of things you can point to in our culture that condition us to systematically block out God. Block him out of our consciousness, out of our awareness. And so we live as though we're Lord of our own life. But the important question isn't really, why are we this way? The, the, the important question is, what can we do about it? How do we, get, how do we begin to get back to that New Testament sort of supernatural dimension that they had so that we can own a supernatural lifestyle? And the answer to that is quite simply, it's quite simple, but very challenging. The answer is we have to learn to listen to the Holy Spirit. Actively listen to the Holy Spirit. And when I say actively listening, that means you listen by leaning in. You strain to hear. Because the thing is, God hasn't gone mute. He hasn't taken a vacation. God is here. He is now. He's the same God that they had back then. Same living Lord they had back then, same Holy Spirit they had back then, and God is still talking. He still wants to lead and direct and empower his people. The question is, are his people listening? And here, here's why this is challenging for us. You know, God always respects the personhood of people. He respects their free will and their autonomy. And so God doesn't bulldoze over people. The Holy Spirit, he doesn't usually speak in terms of screams that you can't possibly ignore or the megaphone in your ear. The Holy Spirit tends to speak in a still, small voice that can be ignored. God doesn't bulldoze over people. And so the Holy Spirit doesn't usually shove to get our attention. And here's the thing. If our minds are completely occupied with our stuff, 
with our agendas, our plans, what we've got to do, what we ought to do, you know, all that, we're not going to notice the little nudge. Our brain's already too crowded. There's no space to notice the little whisper of the Holy Spirit. And so, if we're going to be people who start to get in touch with the Holy Spirit and walk with him on a day-to-day kind of basis, we're going to have to declutter our brain, make some space to create an awareness that wherever we go, whoever we're talking to, whatever we're doing, the Holy Spirit's there. He's around us. He wants to work and move through us. And he just might have an opinion about where you should go and who you should talk to and what you should do. And we need to be open to that. Paul said in 2 Timothy, he said, no one serving as a soldier gets entangled in the concerns of civilian life. He seeks to please the commanding officer. So we're the soldier in that passage, right? And our job is to please the commanding officer. To do that, we can't get so entangled in the concerns of civilian life with the, the stuff, the cares, the concerns of life that we, we turn off our walkie-talkie or don't notice that they're on. You know, we've got to save space in our awareness to lean into that small, gentle voice of the Holy Spirit who still wants to speak to us. The Spirit speaks through a sense you might get, um, just a sense, an impression that you're supposed to do this or talk to that person. Sometimes the Spirit speaks through an image that just flashes through your mind. Or it could be a sudden mood change. As you notice somebody, you have have an empathy or compassion towards them. The Spirit speaks in those kind of ways. But they are ways that we can easily ignore unless we're looking for them and paying attention to them. Our problem really here is this. One aspect of the culture that influences, influences us here in the West is that we're heirs of the Enlightenment, the scientific revolution. And out of the scientific revolution came what's called the naturalistic worldview. Now, Christians don't believe in naturalism, but we're easily influenced by it. Naturalism just holds that the universe is a closed system. There's nothing outside the universe that can ever break in. There's nothing supernatural. Everything that happens has a natural explanation to it, cause and effect. And what happens is that it gets applied to our brain and our interior life. And we tend to assume that everything that goes on in our brain and everything we feel is simply our doing. We did it. And so if we're walking along and we notice a sense or an image or an impression or something of that sort, well, first of all, if we're just doing our own agendas, we're kind of walking in a naturalistic mindset, carrying out our own plans, we probably aren't even going to notice it because our brain's too crowded. But even if we do notice it, that sense, that impression, that thing that just popped into your head or popped into your heart, we tend to dismiss it. It's just some random brain synapses firing. And the brain does a funny thing, you know? It's a funny thing. And we just sort of push it aside. We just dismiss it. We discredit our interior world the spontaneity of our interior world. But see, that's where the Spirit speaks. And so if we're dismissing all the senses and the impressions and all that stuff, we're dismissing the Holy Spirit oftentimes. I I suspect we do this all the time, right? We're conditioned to do this. So if we're going to be people who are walking in the Spirit, we've got to be people who push back on the naturalism of our culture, the conditioning of our culture, And first of all, begin to notice the senses and the impressions and intuitions that we have, and then begin to give them some credibility to the point where we'll act on them. There ought to be a spontaneity in our life where there's maybe on a daily basis things that we do that we didn't plan on doing. Maybe even things that we do that interrupt what we had planned on doing. Because that's how the Holy Spirit speaks to us and walks with us. Now you might ask the question, well, how do you know when it's the Holy Spirit and not random synapse of sighing? And the answer is, I don't know. I really don't. I usually don't know if it's just me or the Holy Spirit. I don't. And actually, I worry a little bit about people who don't have that question, right? 
I met some where if they felt it or they thought it, well, then it must be the Holy Spirit. That's not so good either. So a little bit of humility is in order because we don't always know. That's why we aren't people who say, thus saith the Lord, right? No, just I'm getting a sense that maybe. And if it lands, it lands. Here's how I try to operate. Now, I don't always get it right, but if I have a sense or an intuition, impression, image, whatever that just pops into my head, I ask, is this something that Jesus would do? If the answer is yes, then I do it. Because worst case scenario, you just did something that Jesus would have done, and you did it on your own, which isn't a bad thing, right? That's a good thing. You just did a Jesus thing. So if Jesus would do it, then do it. And I think you will find that maybe sometimes when you do that once in a while, bam, it lands, right? That's exactly what the situation called for. And that's the confirmation that was, in fact, the Holy Spirit leading you. That's a kingdom-orchestrated event. So recently, Katie and I were in Target doing some shopping. Katie was looking at makeup. I was zoned out because I don't wear makeup. There was, a, there was a female employee there talking to another employee. I happened to hear her say that it was going to be a rough day because her sister's on the, in the hospital on a ventilator. So I think, oh, man, that's a bummer. And I, when we start moving to another area of the store, as we do that, I feel an impression. An impression. I should go pray for her. And I say to myself, eh, no, okay, that's just me. That's just me. Just forget about it. That's brain synapses firing. You know, I'll pray for her while I'm shopping. But it kept coming back. So I'm like, please go away. <laughs> but it wouldn't go away. So finally I had to stop and tell Katie, I think God wanted me to do something about two minutes ago. I didn't do it. So now I got to go back and do it. And I went back to the makeup department, hoping she was still there, and she was. And I went up to her and I said, did I hear you say that your sister's on a ventilator? She said, yeah. I said, would you mind if I prayed for you and your sister? She said, okay. And I took 15 seconds and prayed for them. And Katie and, Katie and I said, God bless you and your sister. And that was that. I'm not sure that that was the Holy Spirit. It could have just been random synapses, although it was really persistent. But it might have just been one of those things. On the other hand, I think it was probably a Holy Spirit thing. Even if it wasn't, that lady met someone who cared enough to stop and pray for her. That's something Jesus would have done. So it's a good thing. And I tell you this, this story as an example only. I'm not tooting my own horn at all. I'm not great at this. It is just that whatever it takes to remember to do this, we've got to do it. Because it's hard to change our mental habits. We're used to thinking naturalism. That everything that goes on in our head is our own doing. And so we're used to censoring out all the stuff that doesn't make sense. I believe we habitually censor God out. And it's hard to swim upstream on this one. But we got to do it. Because this is the only way to begin to tap into that supernatural dimension of our faith. That the New Testament church really had and own a supernatural lifestyle. And understand, all the gifts of the Spirit, the reason that they strike people as weird now is because we tend not to live in this realm. And so every, having anything supernatural break through seems kind of weird, whereas actually the supernatural ought to be natural for us. It ought to be the pattern of things. We ought to be walking in this on a daily basis. And so it will take reminding one another or putting post-it notes up or whatever you got to do but I challenge us to walk with the awareness that the Holy Spirit is always around us. The Holy Spirit's always in us. The Holy Spirit often wants to talk to us and lead us and direct us. And if we're doing this, I suspect, I suspect it will occur almost every day that we'll do something we didn't plan on doing. Something spontaneous. And once in a while you're going to find confirmation that in fact that was the Holy Spirit. And that's when things get fun. You see, this thing only gets fun when it stops being a belief and starts becoming a reality, an experienced reality that you walk in. So our part is just obedience. God's part is outcome. Right? Our part is listening for the Holy Spirit and just initiating what he wants us to do. 
and then just leaving the results to God. Our job is to tap into the power of the Holy Spirit and to be his hands and his feet and his mouth here on earth. And God will do the rest. You know, when God created us, he ordained every day of our lives. He knew how long we're going to live. I don't know when I'm going to die. Could be this year. Could be 50 years from now. Who knows? I think that the whole point of me being here is to have some sort of impact. It's not to take up space. In the end, what's going to matter is not that I never embarrassed myself, or that I was a cool guy, or that I played it safe. What matters is, when did I speak up for Jesus? So I can think of times I got scared, I got intimidated, just kept my mouth shut. That's an easy thing to do. Even the great prophets, you know, when God called Moses, Moses said, I can't talk. God says, who made your mouth? What do you mean you can't talk? I'm going to speak through you. Just say what, what I tell you to say. I've, I have regrets over the times I've chickened out. And I don't want to build a lifetime of regrets where I never got it, you know? Where I get to the end and I think, I had the Holy Spirit in me all this time. And I didn't listen. Do you have that, that type of faith as you leave here today, that God really dwells inside of you. That you have the Spirit of God living in you right now. That's pretty intense. That's pretty amazing. What if we all took that seriously and really believed that we were God's instrument and that, this, that His Spirit really dwelt in us and we were His body here on earth? Man, I think we just, what an incredible impact we will have. I'm going to close in prayer. I'd like to ask the prayer teams to come up, as I do. Um, if you're here and you have any need whatsoever that could use prayer, please stop by and have these folks pray for you. You don't have to carry that burden, that concern on your own. Um, and the pastors, me, Katie, Bruce, Greg, will be around after the service for a while if there's anything you'd like to talk about. Um, feel free to come and talk with us. Would you stand up with me? Holy Spirit, we acknowledge that you are real, you are here, you are around us, you are in us, you're still talking. Help us to listen, to actively listen, to, to lean into your voice. Help us, Lord God, to, to not walk with the assumption that everything inside of us is just our own doing. Help us, Lord, to have the boldness to step out when you tell us to step out, to do the things that we didn't plan on doing. Help us, Lord God, to be a people who submit our plans, and our agendas to you. Because, Lord, we confess we are not Lord of our own life. You are Lord of our life. And we want that to count on a moment-by-moment basis. Lord, remind us, because we'll forget. We will forget. So, Holy Spirit, will you bug us? Will you just lovingly nag us? Holy Spirit, wake us up. Wake us up to the reality that you are here, and you we live and move and have our being. And we want to live under your direction. In Jesus' name, in all of God's spirit-led people said, amen. amen. God bless you guys. Love you. Go out and love on the world. Come get prayed for if you'd like.